So if success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, what then is failure? Is failure working on a project that ended with poor results? No, of course not. Is failure launching a new product that failed miserably in the marketplace? No, of course not. Is failure doing the best you possibly can with your kids and having them disappoint you in a very personal way? No, of course not. There's no failure in pouring your heart and soul and energy into something that didn't work. Rather, failure is not trying at all. If success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, then failure is no progress at all. None, not even trying. Success and failure are always linked together. Success and failure are always linked to ambition. And let's remember, success is doing. Failure is not doing. It's that simple. Tom Peters, world-renowned author and management expert, said recently, there is only one way to be in serious trouble today, and that is not to be trying, not to be failing, not to be stretching yourself. Success is a doing. You've got to actually do it. Activity is a high priority in the life process to try and get maximum benefit out of what we have available, our resources, our skills, our knowledge, and our talents. Success is doing that tries to get maximum benefit out of what we have available. Benjamin Disraeli, former Prime Minister of England, once said, nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on its purpose. I'll do it or die. What a powerful set of words. We've already talked about resolve, doing it until. But here's what else. Resolve says, I will. Two of the most powerful words in our language. The formula for disaster, could, should, don't. Here's the formula for success, could, should, will. I will, I should, I can, and I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language, I will. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They say, it's too high, it's too difficult, it's too rocky, it's never been done before. The man says, hey, it's my mountain, I'll climb it. Pretty soon you'll see me wavering from the top or dead on the side because I'm not coming back until I've done it. Powerful. There are several studies that show the greatest achievers aren't those who fail the least. No, the greatest achievers are those least frightened of failure. They're willing to take on the challenge without the guarantee of success, seeing the end, but not sure when it will be or where it will be. Although success and failure go hand in hand, many people have a problem with failure. They think it's a bad word, has a bad connotation. They don't see it as a stepping stone. They see it as an end result. Quite often, success requires failure, sometimes many failures. In every scientific discovery, there were dozens or hundreds of failures before one's success. Without failure, opportunity cannot be created. Without failure, there can be no success. But what is the measure of success? How do you know if you're successful, really successful? How do you know, especially when your success could be so vastly different from someone else's success? Here's how you measure results making measurable progress in reasonable time. That's all life asks, making measurable progress in reasonable time. So you've got to be reasonable with time. Don't be unreasonable with time. Parents, don't be unreasonable with time. Managers, brokers, business associates, have a little patience. You can't ask somebody every five minutes, how are you doing now? That's too soon. The guy says, I haven't left the building yet. Give me a break. So five minutes is too soon to ask. So five years is what? Too long and too late. So what is reasonable time to ask for results as a measure of progress? Here's number one. At the end of the day, you can not let more than a day go by without getting some things done, some letters written, having a conversation with your son or daughter. You can't postpone the important more than a day. When you work on the job, there are some things you gotta get done within a day. You gotta make some calls within a day. Your health disciplines, you gotta get those done within a day. You can't carry over. 
You can't say, well, I'll eat nine apples 10 days from now. No, it's an apple a day. A day, some things you've got to get done within a day. So at five minutes to midnight, and you haven't gotten your apple in yet, munch away and get it done. A day. Here's what's next. A week. Some things you've got to get done within a week. Stuff on the job, calls made, activities. A week is a good chunk of time. Can't let more than a week go by without taking a look and a measure to see how you're doing. Second, in the last 90 days, how many books have you read to invest in the miracle of your mind, give you ideas to ponder, fashion your future with meticulous care? How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Third question, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills for your future and your family? How many classes in the last six months? I'm telling you, numbers tell us everything. Success is a numbers game. You've got to make progress. You've got to make progress in reasonable time. You've got to take a look at the numbers and see how you're doing. It's the name of the game. How often should you weigh the new baby? Well, you say, I'll weigh the new baby next spring. No, you can't wait until next spring. Don't you have to weigh the new baby often? And the answer is yes, of course. To see what? To see whether it's gaining weight or it's losing weight. What if it's losing weight? The alarm bells have got to go off. You can't let a little baby lose weight very long. It's called disaster. These numbers are important. How often should you check the corporation to see if it's healthy or not? You say, well, in a couple of years. Well, get all the accounts together. No, you'll be out of business in Las Vegas, the big gambling houses. Guess how often they put together a financial statement to see where they are several times a day why so much is happening. If you don't learn when to shut down some of those tables, you'll be out of business by midnight. You can't wait till midnight. You can't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow's too late. You've got to know the numbers. What is your cholesterol count? You don't know and you don't care. You've just got your fingers crossed for the future. We'd better come and get your family and take them to safety. Come on. Be responsible for the set of your own sale. Leave it to no one else but yourself and learn to refine these numbers for yourself. Now, what if your results are not that good right now? What if you're going through some tough times and aren't quite sure what to do next? You know why I do seminars and lectures and write books and audio programs? So I can attend them all myself, read it again myself, listen again myself. I don't do it just to hear myself talk. And I don't do it for the money. I do it because the teacher always receives the greatest lessons he seeks to teach others. What's the best way out of a blue mood? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way out of a mental energy slump? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way to start solving your own problems? Talk to somebody else about theirs. Why? Because when you start talking someone else through their blue mood or their mental slump or their problem, you'll hear yourself say amazing things. You'll hear all the knowledge that you've gathered come out to help this other person. And it will ultimately help you by hearing it again. It just works that way. It's often easier to tap our resources for somebody else than it is to tap them for ourselves. Sometimes defeat is the best beginning. Why? Well, for one, if you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go, up. But more importantly, if you're flat on your back mentally and financially, you'll usually become sufficiently disgusted to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull out miracles, pull out talents, and pull out abilities, and pull out desires and determination. When you're flat broke or flat miserable, you'll eventually become so disgusted that you'll pull out the basic essentials required to make everything better. And it's in the face of adversity that things begin to change. That you begin to change. With enough disgust, desire, and determination to change your life. You'll start saying, I've had it. Enough of this. No more. Never again. 
Here's where the miracle begins. I've had it, enough, no more, never again. These words and these thoughts really rattle the power of time and fate and circumstances. And these three things, time and fate and circumstances, all get together and say, okay, okay, we can see that we have no power here. We're facing some major resolve. This guy's not gonna give up. He's had it. He's done with all this nonsense. We better step aside and let this guy get by. Resolve inspiration through disgust. But a lot of people don't change themselves. They wait for change. Circumstances to change. The government to change life to change. What'll that do? Not much. These poor, unfortunate folks accept their defeats and wallow in their self-pity. Why? Because they refuse to take control of the situation. They refuse to take control of their life, their career, their health, their relationships, their finances. They refuse to take control and take responsibility and get sufficiently disgusted to change it. But if you are disgusted, if you are making changes, if this program finds you in the middle of your own personal slump, then I have some words to offer you. Your present failure is a temporary condition. It is only a temporary condition. You will rebound from failure just as surely as you gravitated into failure. Somebody once suggested to me in a bout of failure that I should tell myself that this too shall pass. I firmly believe that you're only given as much as you can handle, as much negativity, as much failure, as much disappointment. This too shall pass if you grasp for a new beginning, if you pull yourself up and move back into the world with a plan. So, as foolish as it might sound, be thankful for your current limitations or failures, for they are building blocks from which to create greatness. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can become what you want to become. You can do it all, starting now, starting right where you are. So be grateful for adversity, but for your future. Make it work for you, not against you. Make your failures give birth to great opportunity, not prolonged agony. Make your disgust lead to inspiration, not depression. The world will willingly sit by and let you wallow in your sorrows until you die, broke and alone. And here's what else the world will do. The world will step aside and let you by. Once you decide that your present situation is only temporary, once you decide to get back on your feet and make your mark, the world doesn't care which choice you make to stop here or to go on. The world doesn't really care. So you have to. You have to care in your own enlightened self-interest. Give a run at adventure. Keep your eyes firmly on the achievement, on your ambition, and not merely existence and self-pity. Make a commitment to excellence. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. What you pursue usually eludes you like a butterfly, something you go after that you can't catch. Success is something you attract like a magnet by the person you become to attract attractive people. We've talked about this before. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. To attract powerful people, you must be powerful. To attract committed people, you must be committed. Instead of going to work on them, you go to work on yourself. You work harder on yourself than you work on the job. And if you become, you can attract. The whole key is to make yourself valuable. The key is to make yourself attractive. The key is to make yourself skilled, skillful, competent, willing, powerful, unique, sophisticated, cultured, being able to manage, in control, healthy. The whole key really to the future is personal development because the greatest gift you can give to someone else is your personal development, self-development, self-investment. The greatest gift you can give is your own personal development. If I become 10 times wiser, 10 times stronger, 10 times brighter, 10 times more competent, think of what that will do for my success. If I grow, Think of what that will do for my future. Self-development earns success. Self-investment earns respect. And the only way to make a better and better and better investment in your future is to become better and stronger and wiser and more competent. 
And the more attractive you become, the more attractive you are. And the more attractive you are, the more you attract success. Self-development, self-investment attracts success. That's powerful. Now here's what would be pitiful if your income grew and you didn't grow. Because here's what usually happens. If your income takes some jumps, it's best that you grow quickly up to where your income is. Why? Because otherwise, your income will soon come back to where you are. Somebody once said, if someone hands you a million pounds, it's best you become a millionaire. So you get to keep the money. I'm telling you, success doesn't want to hang around an incompetent person. That's the problem with winning the lottery, the lack of self-development, to be able to master it and keep it. And now the fortune is bigger than the person rather than the person being bigger than the fortune. If you're a parent, use that as a challenge to grow. Personally, use the challenge of parenting to grow. See what you can become. One ancient writer said this. Here are some reassuring words. God's arm is not short. Aren't those reassuring words? God's arm is not short. You can't think of anything more pitiful than a God with a short arm. Poor God, his arm's too short. He can't reach all the way, can't reach out to all of us. This writer said, no, be reassured. God's arm is not short. He can reach all the way and he can reach everybody. Shouldn't that be said of every father, of every mother? They can reach all of their children. They can reach all the way. They don't lack stories and illustrations. They don't lack wisdom and power. And the only way you can become that kind of parent the only way you can keep up that process is by personal development, by becoming better than you are, stronger than you are, wiser than you are becoming, becoming, growing so that your investment grows. As your children grow, you grow, your power grows, your influence grows, your wisdom grows, your command of the language grows. You see, that's what's challenging to be involved in a situation that makes you grow. If that situation is success, keep growing to be bigger than your fortune. If that situation is failure, keep growing until you're bigger than the problem. Keep growing, keep becoming, keep doing it until now. There are two qualities that can increase your chances of success. Two very important qualities. Number one, patience. Number two, persistence. Let's talk about patience for a moment. Patience is what? Learning to handle the passing of time. Now, once you've had an appetite for success and you start going for it, now, you've got to learn to handle the passing of time. Here's why it takes time. It takes time to build a corporate work of art. It takes time to build a symphony orchestra with flawless music and harmony that sends you on flights of ecstasy to be remembered long after the orchestra has shut down and the lights have gone out. It takes time to put harmony together. It takes time to build a life. It takes time to build an enterprise. It takes time to get through school. It takes time to develop and grow. So give your enterprise time. Give your business time. If you're in management, give your people time. If you're a parent, give your kids time. Don't be too short, too quick. Give them time now, not forever, but time. It takes time. Here's the ultimate challenge. You've gotta have patience with yourself. It takes time to make changes in habit and discipline. It takes time to correct old errors in judgment and to finally give up old blame and pick up new responsibility. I'm telling you, it took me some time. I used to blame the government and blame taxes and blame the company and blame the marketplace. It took me a long time to give that up. That was a pretty comfortable list to explain. My empty bank account, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, not doing well, embarrassed by my situation. It took time to give that up and only blame myself. That took a while. So have patience with yourself, number one. And number two, while you're dealing with the passing of time, number two is to keep doing it. Be persistent, be tenacious. Keep doing it until as long as you are patient and persistent. It's hard to elude success as long as you maintain patience and persistence, tenacity. There's only one person, just one person, that will draw the line between success and failure. 
one person, and that person is you. So be patient, be persistent. You need both patience and persistence together. And here's why. Lack of patience is probably the worst enemy of ambition. While your ambition keeps growing, keeps moving, keeps looking for new ways to succeed, impatience tends to grow frustrated. Impatience won't allow for persistence. Impatience wants to give up. Impatience calls discouragement failure. But your ambition won't let you give up so easily, not if you're persistent. What others may call failure, ambition calls a learning opportunity, a chance to make adjustments along the charted course to success. Ambition knows something else too. Ambition knows that the longer the achievement is in coming, the more valued it is. So let me give you a few aspects of patience, some examples that might help illustrate just how valuable it is. There are six aspects of patience. And here's number one, knowing when an opportunity is right and when more preparation is needed. Let's say you're opening up a restaurant specializing in fresh seafood. You're all excited to get going, get the money coming in instead of it all going out. You're all excited. So because you're all excited, you want to open early. Your impatience gets the best of you. And so you do open before your scheduled grand opening. Customers start coming in. They're all excited about this new great restaurant and everybody wants some fresh seafood. They're all ordering fresh seafood from the menu. But now you panic. You haven't got any. You're not ready. The fresh seafood shipment won't come in for a week. Impatience has just killed the restaurant. Now let's say you've got a great new product that's scheduled to come out on the market in the next several months. Everything's going according to plan. So you start planning your ads, start planning big public relations events. You're so sure that it's going to happen that you set a date. The engineers told you that the product's not ready, but you're sure it will be. You start planning everything. Invite lots of people, influential people, buyers of your product. You're so excited that you went ahead without the product actually being done. Come the week of the grand unveiling, the engineers come to you and say it still doesn't work. Your impatience just lost you credibility in the marketplace. That's number one. Be patient in knowing the difference between when the opportunity is right and when more work needs to be done. Here's number two. Remain alert even if opportunity doesn't come right away. Make sure that your patience allows you to keep your eyes open and ready for opportunity. Keep looking, be patient. Number three, keep preparing for opportunities, even if there's a delay, even if things aren't going just the way you think they should. Keep your disappointments at bay and keep getting ready for opportunities. Be prepared, always be prepared. Don't let impatience allow you to give up. Number four, take the little setbacks in stride. Take the little successes in stride don't let small disappointments discourage you. Don't let the little successes delude you. Avoid the emotional roller coaster that will always, always disrupt your plan. Number five, if you're waiting on the decisions of others, be patient. You cannot control the decision-making abilities of others. You cannot control their timing. If your project was to come up before the board in one meeting and time ran out, and they moved your project to the top of the agenda for the next meeting. Be patient. Don't be frustrated about what you have no control over. And number six, take a vacation from your ambition. If you've been working day after day, week after week, month after month without a break, take a vacation from your ambition. The patient person, secure in their ambition, knows that the drive and ambition will still be there even after some time off. As a matter of fact, with some time off, the ambition will have a stronger pull than ever when you come back to it. Persistence is patience in action. Persistence is creative, always looking for new opportunities. Persistence is courageous. It doesn't give in to fear. Persistence is hopeful. It doesn't let discouragement through the door. Persistence is positive. It keeps you on track with your plans and your goals. And the last thing that persistence is, is cheerful, not gloomy, cheerful. Persistence knows that gloom and depression and disappointments waste energy. Cheerfulness creates it. Patience and persistence are both required for success. 
And as we end this side, please remember that success and failure are also intricately intertwined. For without failure, you can never appreciate success. Success, and quite often without failure, there will never be success.